Hi, my name is Jared Overson, and this is the, the real title to my talk, but whenever I name things kind of boring, no one goes to the talks. Um, so this is otherwise known as Idiot Proofing Your Code. Ideally, my, my titles would be uh, Managing JavaScript Complexity, or the, the Joys of Static Analysis, or How to Automate Testing and Influence People. But the only way to actually get people to come to talks like that is to actually have some sort of clickbait and drag you in here because you don't really want to come to the talk, but you want to know what the hell I'm talking about. Um, because a title like this evokes some sort of reaction in you. I mean, probably doing some sort of code for a period of time and you look at a title like this and you're like, I really need to know what this guy's talking about because I have idiots all around me. My, my production manager is an idiot, my, my scrum master is an idiot for thinking that scrum was a thing. Um, everyone on my team is an idiot every time they touch my code they break everything. Everyone around me is an idiot in some way and I need a way to protect these myself from these <laughs> mouth-breathing cretins. Um, so this is, this is how I get you here. And then I immediately insult you by telling you all that you're all the idiots I'm talking about. Me too. I'm a gigantic idiot. Some of the code that I wrote a few years ago is, is outright embarrassing. I once, I, I once tried to test for the existence of this and then do something for it, um, as if this would not exist in any normal common situation. Um, but anyway, that's, that's why we're here. Uh, we do stuff like this. Um, this might not be immediately obvious what's happening at the start, which makes it all the more dangerous. Um, this is a, a value and a function, um, which of course would be incredibly, incredibly intuitive for anyone as they're walking through the code. Um, if you want to know how this actually works, uh, I won't tell you, um, but you can ask me afterward and maybe uh, you'll convince me. Because as soon as you find out how to do something like this, if you don't already know, you're like, wow, this is really cool. I want to do something with it. And of course, it's a horrible, horrible idea. Or we do stuff like this um, because we want to have some sort of way of defining easily some sort of duration in milliseconds. Um, so we, we I don't know, have some functions and we're like, oh, what would be really cool if we add some stuff to the number prototype? And you realize you can't do that, because, or you can do that, but you have to do something like this because for dot something, um, JavaScript uh, parser interprets that as a decimal number. So for dot dot you find works you're like that's really cool I can do something with it and you do and it's awful because it does stuff like this and of course if you actually even notice these aren't even functions so the way you do it is even further screwed up um, or we do stuff like this does anyone have any idea what would happen in this situation and of course no one would do this right but I would never have thought of doing this had I not actually seen it in the first place this actually reloads the page as JavaScript. I don't even remember what the use case was, but it was clearly a bad idea. Because all this stuff that we do when we think it's clever is a pain in the ass down the line. Six months ago, no matter how good you, your code was, it's awful now. And if you don't think it's awful, then you might be one of the problems, so we should talk about you later. Um, but it, it's, it's not necessarily that each of us individually is an awful person. Uh, some of us are just, they think they're clever. Uh, some of us are lazy. Some of us are bored. Uh, some of us are actually evil and should be fired. Um, but at the end of the day, we're just doing our job. And JavaScript is incredibly hard. And whoever says otherwise has, has gotten to one of those peaks where they think they know everything before they come crashing down and into that pit of despair once they realize they don't actually know anything at all. There are actual full conferences based around the complexity of JavaScript. There's what, uh, uh, MLOC, um, Million Lines of Code, which I think was in Budapest, maybe, the, the Prezi guys. I'm um, not sure if you uh, uh, caught in the news, uh, I think it was a few months ago, but their entire Prezi platform was redone in JavaScript. And this was one of the reasons why they were so interested in how to actually manage millions of lines of JavaScript because this is just a cluster. It's, it's not something that's incredibly easy to do. So we need to account for how difficult it actually is and move forward with, with tools that actually assist us. So how do we get better at it? Um, we have to spend a lot of time examining the practices that we have put into place ourselves, figure out what is actually benefiting us and what can help us move forward and what is dragging the entire code base down. Um, the irony of this, I, actually, who, 
doesn't know the irony of this. Um, because if you don't know, uh, it means you're way younger than me, and I don't want to admit stuff like that. Um, but how much analysis do you actually run on your code? Uh, I don't actually need to know the answer because I know it's not enough, and it's not that you're not running enough analysis necessarily based off the tools that are out there, it's just the tools aren't there that are necessary in order to provide you the, the necessary insight into your code. Uh, we lint appropriately. I hate having slides like this in a presentation because I feel like it's so old hat, but nevertheless, there's always somebody out there who lints or says that they lint or has read about a linter somewhere in their history, um, but it's not nearly as commonplace as it needs to be, especially across an entire code base. Um, there's JS Hint, which uh, is now under the maintenance of Rick Waldron. Uh, ES Lint, which uh, is, uh, I don't know what version it is right now. I think it's actually just, I think actually dot eight was, or yeah, zero dot eight was just released maybe yesterday or today. Um, that's maintained by Nick Zakis. And there's JSCS, which is a code style checker, which is complementary to, to the other two. Um, this is JS Lint, which has largely dropped out of favor due to it being not very configurable, and Closure Linter, neither of those are very useful unless you write code exactly like Crockford or Google, and no one does, because it's just not a fun way to do it. Um, and it's important that you actually, once you use tools like this, you examine what they can do for you. You don't just deal with the default options, because then you're still writing code like somebody else wrote code. And the whole goal around these tools is to, is to get it to check your code and the way you want to write code. So you set things like uh, max parameters. These are, I believe, all off by default in JSint, or at least they were when I wrote this. Uh, ESLint has largely JSint parity, uh, so anything like this you can do in ESLint. Um, this is the, the sets the maximum number of parameters you can actually pass to a function. If you're using something like Angular or AMD, this also has the, the side effect of also limiting the number of dependencies a particular piece of code actually has as max depth, which is the maximum um, uh, nested statements that can exist in a, a block. Max statements, which is the maximum number of logical statements you can have a block, is max length, which is the maximum line length, and that is still relevant even in the days of widescreen monitors because we do get commits in email, we do browse things on places like GitHub, which still has a relatively small width. Um, so it is important that you do actually define these things and enforce these things, and there's also max complexity. Is everyone familiar with psychomatic complexity? Is anyone familiar with psychomatic complexity? It's, it's relatively common in, the, I think, the C-sharp world, maybe Java, depending on, on what IDE you favor. Um, it's also called conditional complexity, which is a little bit more intuitive a name, but we generally use psychomatic complexity because it makes us sound more intelligent. Uh, technically, Cyclomatic complexity is the number of paths through a particular block of code. Now, practically, what that actually means is it's how hard your code is to test. There are eight distinct paths through a block of code. You need to enter it at least eight distinct times in order to ensure that you are, you are covering all possible paths through that code. For example, um, every basic block starts off with a complexity of one because there's one path through a piece of code. As you start adding branches, the complexity increases. This, you can go through either the main block and not the if block, or the main block and the if block. Anyone want to wager a guess what this uh, complexity of this might be? Uh, you don't have to shout out, because you're probably gonna be wrong. This would be embarrassing. This is still a, whoop. Normally that would flibble around. Um, but it's actually a complexity of two, because you're not actually changing the number of paths through the code. You're changing the, the, the actual paths through the code, but it's still either through the if block or not through the if block. So the actual complexity of the block is still two. There's a complexity of three. Um, you can either go through the if block, second if block, or neither. And nested if blocks, same effect. Either go through the, the main block, uh, the inner block, or the inner block and the, uh, the outer block and the inner block. This is what a complexity of seven looks like. And this is obviously completely contrived for the sake of a, a meetup presentation but even without any actual code in there, it's still a hefty looking function. I think it's 10-ish uh, lines of code, including the function wrapper. Um, this also shows that four blocks, would have shown that four blocks uh, also do increase the complexity because you don't, by default, have to go into a four block. I can keep on talking, what's that? Maybe better for the screen? 
Mm. Oh, trust me. You know computers. All right. Uh, now, it's also important to, once we have things like this in place, to actually visualize them up on the screen. Otherwise, uh, they're not going to be in front of everyone all the time. And LCDs and LED displays are incredibly cheap nowadays. There's no real reason to not have uh, giant screens almost everywhere with all sorts of random squiggly data on it. Because it takes very, very little effort to actually get these up and running. We've got Raspberry Pis now, which can, uh, which can show, well, almost anything um, bound by processing power. But for like 35 bucks, you can get a monitor and a Raspberry Pi mounted up on the wall, show whatever you want pretty quickly. Um, this is an example of Elco reports. Uh, this is a code coverage report generated by Istanbul, which is, I believe, a Yahoo production. This shows which, th this instruments the entire code base first. So as you run it, actual uh, statements are injected into the code. So as they are run over by tests or anything else, those statements provide data that can be used to show you what has actually been covered by your tests. So you see here that uh, we don't have uh, that return block covered. This E here shows that the else case for this if statement is not covered, so we've entered the if, but we haven't not entered the if, um, which results in this entire block not being covered. Also shows that we have if blocks as well. Uh, the I shows that the if block has not been entered. And it's not necessarily stating that each one of these things, er, that code coverage in general should ever reach 100%. It's just enlightening you to what actually is covered. Because without something like this, you probably don't actually know. You might have an, an, an idea, but uh, without something to actually tell you, it's hard to, to really understand what it might be. Here's an example also of real live code coverage. This is a code coverage for ESLint, which is just absolutely insane. So there's a, a low of 92.59%, and here's the number of rules that exist. Almost all of them with 100% coverage on statements um, almost all of them with 100% coverage on branches and just about everything else, um, which also gives you a, a pretty good uh, amount of confidence in the project, and also shows to uh, shows a bit as to why 100% coverage isn't always necessarily important. Like the one part that isn't covered right here is the uh, is this ternary that uh, just provides an empty string. You can create another test that explicitly tests for that. But at the end of the day, that's probably not the best use of your time. Uh, the important part is to just get a base level of coverage that you feel is comfortable. And how many, how many people really do test their code? I, I know we may have read a book in college, maybe have heard of other people testing the code. Maybe we tell our teammates or our project managers that we test our code, or we pad time, like, oh, it's gonna take extra time to test, so it's an extra two weeks. Does everyone actually test their code? Front end testing, Jasmine, Mocha, uh, there is a lot that's out there um, nowadays. If you haven't looked into unit testing, JavaScript in general, there it's significantly easier now. Karma exists, which is a great way to uh, test, from, test code cross-browser. Uh, Grunt and Gulp have a ton of great uh, plugins that make all this easier to automate. And the good part of testing isn't necessarily to have a lot of tests in place. It's to show you how to write testable code. You can't accurately test a function that's 300 lines long. So if you start writing tests and you try to test that function, you get frustrated and you break that function down. And that's where a lot of the value does come from, is just by having smaller actual functions. So a lot of code coverage options out there. There's Istanbul, Blanket, JS Cover. Uh, this is a tool I wrote uh, almost a couple years ago uh, called Plato, which gives you insight into a bunch of different metrics on uh, your, your entire code base. So you have stuff like uh, total average lines uh, through everything, the average maintainability, the, the lint errors, uh, psychomatic complexity. Um, goes into a bit about maintainability. Maintainability is another one of those things that is kind of confusing when people hear it. So they hear it at the start and it kind of makes sense until so you actually start to think about it and you wonder how the hell this number is actually uh, gotten to. And it's really just at the end of the day a function of the average effort, average complexity, and average lines. Now the average lines is an obvious, uh, obvious number. Uh, that we can pretty much assume what it is. Average complexity we've already gone over. Average effort makes no sense because that's not a real number in the world. 
That's made up of a function of difficulty and volume, two more numbers that sound kind of intuitive until you actually dig down and realize that they make no sense. And difficulty is a function of the unique operators, total operands, and unique operands of a program. Now this makes sense. These are concrete things that exist. Volume is a function of the length and the vocabulary. Again, two things that don't really make sense. The length is a function of the total operators and to total operands, and vocabulary is a function of the unique operators and unique operands. So the gist of maintainability is essentially as the code base increases and the number of branch uh, trends upward, the more you use in a language, the more complex it is to maintain. Um, but it's also it's a BS number. So it, if you have code that you feel like looks good and it gives you a certain number and if you if the code changes so that it looks bad to you and the number changes then there's some value to it but none of these numbers uh, that any of these programs provide should be used to compare code across code bases so you would never use something like this to, com to compare like ember versus angular because those are completely separate these allow you to, to see trends in the overall, overall scale and history of, a, of an application. Uh, there's also, well, there isn't actually uh, doc coverage because it doesn't exist. It would be cool if it existed. As far as I know, it doesn't exist. If you guys do know it exists, then please tell me. Um, but uh, documentation is another thing that a lot of us don't write uh, because it sucks to write. Companies go out of their way to actually hire uh, technical writers to actually get documentation in, and it sucks. The uh, syntax for documentation sucks. Finding out what is what is what should be covered in documentation isn't is a pain in the ass. Um, but it is something that's important. Uh, the next step after you've actually examined the parts of your code base that are important is to automate the enforcement of it. Yeah. So if it's not easy. It's just not going to get done. And if it's not automatic, it's not going to get done well every time. And if it's not visible, it might as well not be done at all. So build first. In this world of JavaScript, it's no longer really acceptable to not have a build process at the start because you're almost always, 98% of the time, going to need some sort of build. Unless you're running an extremely small NPM-based module, you're going to want at least, base, at least some sort of minification in place. And if you have minification in place, you already have the start of the build process, so it's important to formalize that so you can extend it properly. <clears throat> of course, the first reaction to that is that uh, you don't want to because it's a gigantic pain in the ass. And you look into Yeoman, if that is a giant pain in the ass. Yeoman can automate the, the creation of entire directory structures, uh, scaffolding, boilerplates. Um, it prompts you for information. Uh, names, starting version numbers, repositories, whatever you want, and it's easily configurable. <coughs> of course, nobody wants to learn Yeoman, so it's one more thing that you have to add to your tool chain that's kind of pain in the ass. Have you ever heard anyone say uh, you shoot for excellence or, or you only ever do the right thing? And stuff like this may be the right thing, and it's just a pain in the ass because it's different than, than what we might be useful. And I started using Yeoman as well, and it's gone through some fluctuation. If you used Yeoman when it was announced, it has changed drastically uh, post 1.0. No longer incorporates Bower and Grunt into, into its system. It's basically just a scaffolding generator, which is great when you, wanna, when you want to uh, dump out the boilerplate for entire applications. So you can install a generator generator with Yeoman and then use that generator generator to generate your generators. It's relatively straightforward. Uh, the base generator uh, just throws out a bunch of stuff that is most likely useful for the wide variety of, of projects. Um, but of course, after the, the frustration of having to deal with the build and having to deal with Yeoman, uh, they see what's actually created and dump the whole thing away because no one actually needs all those files. Of course, at this point, everyone, someone around you should tell you to shut up and suck it up. But you can delete, add, and modify those files relatively easy. It's extremely simple to alter a base generator and then publish it to your own particular NPM registry, um, which you can do with a tool like Synopia or your own sort of artifact repository. So how many people have used Grunt? How many people, no, I'm sorry. How many people love Grunt? That's gonna change the number of hands. How many people love Gulp? How many people hate one or the other? How many people hate putting their hands up at meetups? 
<laughs> that should have been near 100% coverage there. Um, but it really doesn't matter at the end of the day as long as you choose and commit to one. And you can choose and commit to anything that exists out there. It really, really doesn't matter as long as you are ready to support it. If you're the type of person who looks at grunt or gulp and says, what's the problem with make files? Why can't we just use make files? There's plenty of options that already exist out there. You can do that, but you're the one who needs to support that. The thing about grunt or gulp is that they already have very, very large communities around them of people who are doing a lot of the same things that you're gonna be doing. So it's easy to just delegate that support to online communities, forums, IRC, email lists, whatever else. You want code coverage? Easily with Grunt Contrib Jasmine, uh, Grunt Mocha Istanbul, Grunt JS coverage. If you're, if you're already writing tests, if you're already using Grunt, you can wire in code coverage almost automatically. Linting uh, is a Grunt Contrib JSN. Also, the Grunt Contrib plugins are the suite of Grunt plugins that are maintained by a core Grunt team. So as Grunt changes, uh, the plugins in the Grunt Contrib suite are more likely to stay more up to date more quickly. There's also Grunt JS CS Checker. There's wide, wide variety. I think there's uh, upwards of 2,400 Grunt plugins right now. Docs, Grunt Contrib, UE Doc, JS Doc, Doco. There's no excuse to have anything manual right now. And if you do have anything manual, it's just one more place that your code base can be screwed up by either you or somebody else. If you create a project, you don't come back to it for six months, it's gonna be very annoying to get back up to speed unless everything's automated for you. And at least, if you don't understand everything at the start, you have some sort of automated program assisting you down the line. And at the end of the day, if nothing is actually enforced, then there is very little value than anything that has been done so far. This is the only good Robocop movie that existed. So, we all have our own code style uh, guidelines. Do people go through the effort of actually establishing a code style in their company? It's something that, that a lot of people do. Uh, do you enforce it? So if there's a code style, uh, if there are code guidelines up on a wiki or in some Git repository somewhere or even online, they're good at getting people bootstrapped into how you write code, but unless it's actually enforced, you or somebody else is gonna be bitching about somebody uh, having 111 character long lines in some pull request somewhere, and that's no, not a good use of your time or anybody's time. And I, I only recently moved up to this area, but I think salaries are between 80,000 and 400 million. So there's no point in you spending any of your time bitching over something that can and should be automated. So get everyone together, agree about the code style, the, the metrics, the build tools you're using, the data formats, even naming conventions, uh, and curly braces. Please, agree on curly braces, because that is by large the most argued about damn thing in the world. <laughs> and you document that. You treat the documents uh, on your code style guidelines as code. You keep it in Git. You keep it next to your code. You keep it near your code. You keep it easy to update, as easy to update as code. You use GitHub. There's a lot of companies that already do this. Airbnb has a style guide up there. Um, there's others that exist out there. There's like 18 billion forks of the Airbnb style guide, so you can be reasonably assured that if you're writing code like Airbnb, you're probably doing it similar to everyone else. Um, and enforce it, enforce everything. Uh, version control hooks and continuous uh, integration. <coughs> code reviews, reports, ideally automated uh, everything. And warnings should be errors. You should never get to a point where you start ignoring warnings because they start building up because then there's no point in having them in the first place. CI is important because you can't always rely on Git hooks to be working properly or perhaps someone to have installed them well to begin with. So if you have something like Jenkins or Bamboo or Team City or whatever, when anything gets pushed, any pull request, have it run through everything that enforces everything that you want. Make it extremely difficult to be run because then it completely lifts that burden from you and everyone on your team. The automation choice, the automation choice you do choose needs to and needs to accommodate this enforcement. Grunt and Gulp do a very good job because they build some sort of idea of a task chain along everything. 
So as you, as you build everything, you can run your tests initially and then Uglify, uh, Lint, uh, have code coverage, whatever else. If any of those things break down the line, it fails the entire build, nothing gets done. And it's very easy to see when things go wrong. You can't get all the way without going through each step successfully. So you're using uh, Grunt Mocha Istanbul, which uh, incorporates uh, Mocha with Istanbul. So if you're using Mocha unit tests, then it's very easy to add code coverage and code coverage checking with uh, the Grunt Mocha Istanbul plugin. Allows you to specify limits for uh, max or minimum code coverage on statements, branches, lines, functions. So you can see down there uh, this is the default for some uh, contrived example directory. Once you actually specify a minimum limit, a minimum threshold, it'll fail the entire build. So if you have a hard rule that tests get written in your code base, then if you apply a minimum threshold in there and somebody keeps on adding code without actually increasing the test coverage, then it'll fail the entire build, which will be exposed to everyone on your team, which will, will be obvious in pull requests, which is able to be done in things like Travis CI, if you have open source projects, anything along those lines. It's incredibly simple and there's very little excuse to not do that nowadays. To recap, the gist of all this is to automate everything. So you automate your analysis, you automate your enforcement, you automate everything that you've decided upon. Because if you don't do it, then at some point, it's not going to be done. And once everyone gets into the habit of not doing it, then everything falls to shit pretty quickly. <clears throat> That's the gist of it. This is, uh, I'm Jared Overson. I work at Shape Security. Um, I moved to Shape uh, about three months ago now uh, because of their unique offer and the unique things that they are doing. I was working at Riot Games, arguably one of the coolest companies to work for. I had a house down in San Diego and, and now I'm, I'm working for a hardware security company. Uh, living next to a dusty lot of Apple construction. So if anyone is, is curious as to, as to why I made the move and why many other really, really cool JavaScript developers did, um, then come chat with me or us if anyone else is here. Um, we got Arya Hidia, uh, creator of PhantomJS, Esprima, um, Michael Fakara, the, the creator of CoffeeScript Redux, uh, the, the CoffeeScript compiler. Um, at the uh, creator of Venus, but the writers of a bunch of books. It's a really, really cool place doing cool stuff. And that is it for me. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>